Our epistle lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 26. Paul writes, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So are we warm and dry yet? There is nothing like a sunrise service in March to test our mettle as the Easter people. All through this chilly Holy Week, I've heard it over and over again. It doesn't feel like Easter. Let's admit it. We like an April Easter. Late April. <laughs> we like warm weather and green grass and flowers. Springtime is such a great context for Easter. With everything springing to new life around us, it's easy to accept the idea of resurrection. It's almost too easy. It begins to seem that resurrection is a natural product of biology, a foregone conclusion, inevitable. But if we were celebrating Easter in the Southern Hemisphere, we'd be in autumn, headed into winter. Instead of admiring daffodils and apple blossoms, we might be watching leaves fall and hunkering down for another winter. How would we feel about resurrection in that context? What would it be like to gather in autumn for our annual retelling of the Easter story? The habits and commitment of our faith might keep us confident in the resurrection of Christ, but if we were buying fuel for the furnace and staring down into the tunnel of a long, dark winter to come, would we feel the promise of new life for ourselves? How does the context affect our ability to tell our part of the story, the story of our own resurrection to come? Resurrection is a powerful story to tell. When I stand in God's acre on Easter Sunday, I think about the power of that story to draw so many people to this place. I think, too, of the individual faith stories represented by the verses chiseled into the headstones. Many of these words testify to confidence in the resurrection of the dead. His servants shall see him and they shall see his face. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Our belief in Jesus' resurrection gives us confidence in our own. But without the right context, we may sometimes struggle to find that confidence. That seems to be what's happening to the church in Corinth when Paul sits down to write them a letter. Now, the first letter to the Corinthians starts off positively enough. Paul can be prudent and even ingratiating when it suits his purposes. <laughs> 
and he begins by reminding the church of its, its many blessings. He says it is in every way enriched in Christ with all speech and all knowledge, and as a result it is not lacking in any spiritual gift. Its people have heard the word, they are educated in it, they have an abundance of spiritual gifts. That's the good news, which Paul acknowledges in a few sentences before turning to the things that are not going well in Corinth. You can see the context in which Paul writes by what he preaches against in this letter. Dissension, factionalism, boasting, immorality. Some quarreling parties are even resorting to lawsuits against one another. Meanwhile, with all this going on, they struggle to understand the concepts of a brand new religion. Given that their theological debate takes place in this context, of quarreling and mistrust and one-upsmanship and all manner of sin against one another, it's no wonder that the Corinthians are in full-blown theological crisis. And at the heart of that crisis is the question of resurrection. As we learn in chapter 15, at least some of the Corinthians are saying that there is no resurrection of the dead, at least not for folk like themselves. There is no evidence that they have stopped believing in Christ's resurrection, but they've stopped believing in their own. Why? Maybe the problem is contextual. In a context of boasting and factionalism, perhaps some of the Corinthians feel pressure to find the exact right answers to all the difficult theological questions. And so maybe some of them got tangled up in trying to specify exactly how resurrection works. As we know from remarks in the Gospels, some of the Jews of Jesus' time already believed in resurrection, while for others it was a new idea. For Gentiles, like the ones in Corinth, there was no widespread assumption that resurrection was a possibility. So they struggled to conceive of it, and maybe as they struggled, they reinterpreted it. There's clear evidence in the letter that some of the Corinthians are feeling a bit more spiritually evolved than their fellow Christians. Perhaps some have interpreted the promise of resurrection to mean a heightened spirituality which they have already achieved. That is, they have already attained resurrection here on earth. Perhaps this is what all the boasting is about. I'm resurrected and you're not. So now, added to the already difficult context of Corinth, perhaps we have some people trumpeting their so-called resurrection as the deserved reward for their superior spiritual achievements. And in that context, perhaps others see themselves as undeserving. If resurrection is a reward that you have to deserve, and I'm looking at people who tell me that they deserve it, and they seem to be better or smarter or holier than me, then I guess I can't believe that I will be resurrected. Well, by now the context at Corinth is so fraught with anxiety that perhaps some have gotten exhausted by it all and given up and decided that the promise of their resurrection is an idle tale. Just like the disciples thought, according to Luke, when the women returned from the tomb with the news of Jesus' resurrection. Those words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. What if the story had ended there? And what would have happened to the church in Corinth if their own story had ended the same way? If the one-time believers came to see the promise of their own resurrection as an idle tale? What if the product of the wintry context at Corinth is a church whose members no longer believe in their own resurrection. What would that look like? Well, Paul builds a vision of what it would look like. Actually, you might say that he unbuilds it, taking it away one block at a time, starting from the bottom. Because the way he goes about his argument is just backwards compared to how the resurrection is usually preached. Think about what you'd expect to hear a preacher like me say on an Easter Sunday like this. 
Actually, I already said it. Our belief in Jesus' resurrection gives us confidence in our own. That's the formula we've come to know. But Paul comes at it from the opposite direction. Let's assume, as some of the Corinthians do, that there is no resurrection of the dead. Well, if that's true, we must also assume that Christ has not been raised. Imagine the shock that Paul has just delivered to the Corinthians. Remember, whatever they think about God's ability or desire to raise them from the dead, they don't seem to have lost faith in Christ's resurrection. But now Paul tells them that Christ's resurrection is dependent on their own. If resurrection is not possible for you, each one of you, then it was not possible for Christ, who therefore was not resurrected. Paul has just pulled a building block right out of the foundation of the church, and he goes on pulling, whisking out each block as if it weighed nothing, unbuilding the vision of the church block by block. If there is no resurrection of the dead, Christ has not been raised. Whisk. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Whisk. And your faith is in vain. Whisk. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. Whisk. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Great Scott! Paul has pulled out and tossed aside the pillars of belief upon which the church is built, the preaching of the word, the speaking of God's truth, the efficacy of faith, the forgiveness of sins, all gone. And the structure totters and groans and collapses as if into a sinkhole, tumbling into a dark and silent chasm in fact, a grave from which no one will rise. Not Christ, not the Corinthians, not you and not I. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ, says Paul, have perished. End of story. Except for this sad coda. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Even at this stage in Paul's rhetorical deconstruction, people still fall asleep in Christ. Those without hope in the resurrection were still in Christ when they fell asleep, but what then? Then they left this life. They placed their hope in him till he died, but with no resurrection possible. Death separated them from Christ just like it separates everyone from everyone else. If resurrection is not possible, then the Christian's great love for Christ is in the end lost, like any mortal love. The dead are separated from all whom they have loved, including Jesus. And so those who have loved Christ most have lost him through death, and they are intensely pitiable. This is the logical end to which Paul's unbuilding has brought us. If we lose faith in our own resurrection, we are of all humanity most to be pitied. There is nothing on earth more pitiful than a Christian who has lost his hope. Or since Paul says we, evidently there is nothing more pitiful than a church that has lost its hope. A church that lost its hope and then just got tired, so tired that it fell asleep, and with no resurrection possible, was separated from Christ. Will the last one to lose hope please turn out the lights? But the word is a snap, the noise of steel against flint, a spark struck in the dark. It is a musical tone that breaks suddenly through darkness, the noise perhaps of a single trumpet pushing back the darkness just before an Easter dawn. But says Paul. This whole scene of destruction that I've just created, this collapse of the church, this is not what happened. But in fact, 
more musical notes, a band playing somewhere in the distance. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The band is playing fully now. The massed bands draw together. The music swells. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then it's hail, all hail, victorious Lord and Savior. The story of Christ's victory over death is what Paul has continually preached to the Corinthians, and they still believe it. But they have stopped believing that they have a part in the story. What do they need to recapture their belief? Maybe they need a better context. In a context of the same old bad behaviors and sins against one another, it must be hard to believe that humanity can ever be made new. In that context, they struggle to believe that their own bodies could be sown perishable but raised imperishable, sown in dishonor but raised in glory, sown in weakness but raised in power, sown as physical bodies but raised as spiritual bodies. Yet their bodies do have a part in the story of resurrection. Our bodies have a part in the story of resurrection. But in times of despair, struggling to understand resurrection in the often discouraging context of our modern world, we have trouble believing it. So what do we do? We do what Paul advised the Corinthians to do. Create the context for belief. Live the context Make love your aim. Create a church, a community, a world where faith, hope, and love abide, and new life is always in evidence. And then you will feel new life in yourselves, and you will know that you have a part in the resurrection story. Here is your part of the story. You are a being whom God created, whom God loves and for whom God has plans even after you die. You are loved so much that nothing can separate you from the love of God ever. When the church creates a context in which you feel that love, you know that new life is possible for all humanity, even you. And you can testify to your hope in the resurrection. And when you tell your story of hope, you keep hope alive for all, and now it feels like Easter, and resurrection hope lights the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.